But this is not about the character of the sheep. This is about the character of the shepherd. But I think my desire to take care of sheep began early. Now, those sheep will not calm down on their own. But when the shepherd walks in and begins to stroke their heads, begins to touch them, begins to talk to them softly, the competition ends. There's no fighting over who's the dominant because the shepherd is in their midst. Oh, that tonight. Oh, that tonight. Oh, that tonight Jesus would be so real in this room that the competition would leave. The comparing one another would leave. The butting against one another would stop. And we could just lie down in the presence of the shepherd. Oh, just, just lift your hands and thank him for being here right now. Thank him for being here now. And so, that, that problem is solved. The shepherd is their protector. Now, for the sheep to be very comfortable, they have to be free from the frustrations, the ticks, the insects, the things that sting them. You know, there's things that they don't like, they don't want. But they don't have a tail like a horse to slap the flies around. They don't have any way to defend themselves against those insects. So the shepherd comes and he begins to pour oil on them. And he uses dips and he dobs it on their sh uh, fl fleece. They have been protected now from insects. No more competition. Uh, no more anxiety. And now there's no pestering from the insects of the world. That's what tonight is. We're free from the insects. I'm talking about all the junk that's out there in the world that makes it hard for us. We're here with the flock of God and with Jesus our shepherd. So the shepherd solves problem number three because he is their physician. He is their peace. He is their protector. And he is their physician. And the sheep cannot settle down if they're hungry. Why do you think preachers and Christians, when they get together, always want to go eat? Because we can't settle down if we're hungry. Nothing makes a mother more happy. When she sees the empty plates, and she sees grandpa in the chair, eyes closed and snoring, and somebody else laying on the couch. Oh, that's a happy mama. Because she fixed a good meal. And they have all ate. And now they can rest. I think Peru has something that the rest of the world needs. You take a siesta in the afternoon. 
you, you have your lunch and then you just lay down and sleep. And uh, I know uh, that uh, Pastor Brian loves being in Peru. And his favorite thing in Peru is the siesta. I'm getting old enough now that I need a little afternoon nap. And so you get a little afternoon nap all the time here in Peru. The rest of the world would be better off if they did the same thing. I just want to mention that it doesn't just say that he laid them down in green pastures. But it says he leads them beside still waters. And th these, uh, these still waters are as much a part of meeting their need as the food. Yes, they need the grass, but they need the water. Now, sheep are designed anatomically that they cannot drink from fast-moving water. So, so shepherds would dam up the stream, put a dam in, back up the water, and, and, let, and let it become still. And then he would lead the flock down. There's another thing I like about this word where it says still. I've done sometimes. I've walked right out in the middle of the light and created a long shadow. And that long shadow tells me that uh, the shepherd's love and light is behind me and I'm blocking it. And I, I have done my best in life. No matter what, I've done my best. But I think every man and woman can relate to this. When I walk on my own, and get away from my shepherd and turn my back on him. I won't have to fear the evil. No, because he's right there. When I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me and your rod and staff comforts me. Two things can happen when we walk out on our own. We, we, we can go out where the wolves are. And all of a sudden we look and there's a big shadow on the grass. And, and, and we see a, a, a wolf behind the big rock. Oh, but we just feel him. He's still there. I know people that if you don't do just what they want, they'll leave you. But even when the shepherd's heart is broken because you've strayed, he just, he just goes after you. Jesus made that clear when he told the story of going after the lost sheep. Jesus will pursue you. He won't let you go. Oh, I love that new chorus, the reckless love of Jesus. I mean, he'll, he'll tell her down any wall. He'll climb any mountain. I've walked. I've walked in an unwise decision. And even when it was my fault, Jesus rescued me. He 
worked it out. Sometimes the reason I didn't have any money because I'd invested it wrongly and I had misused it. But the shepherd didn't say, go get on welfare. Although I believe in that. And anybody that needs that help should get that help. But even when you have lost the money yourself, he'll work a miracle and turn everything around and make up for your own mistake. Now where are you going to find a Lord like that? Nobody but Jesus. Nobody but Jesus. See that word walk? Yea, though I walk through the valley, it is the Hebrew word yalak. Yalak. And it means depart. So David had actually departed. And more than once he did that. But he still had a heart for God. And what's best of all, God still had a heart for David. I've loved Jesus all of my life. But I wish I could say I've never questioned. I've never wondered or wondered. But I have to be honest here tonight. I wouldn't be here right now if Jesus hadn't pursued me. See, the other danger is not only coming in contact with a wolf, but getting caught in the brush where you can't get out, where you can't get out. And I've been there before. And it wasn't because God put me there. I departed and wondered. And that's what the hook is for. That's what the hook is for. Reach down in there. Pull those, pull those vines loose. Pull that sheep back up on the pasture. He's drawing you right now. Right, right now in this room. The Holy Spirit is here right now. You may have had guilt this very day. You may have come to this conference thinking, I hope nobody finds out the mistake I made. But, but the Holy Spirit is here tonight. The shepherd has his staff in his hand. And he's hooking you right now. Jesus will hook you. He won't let you go over the cliff. He's kept me from falling off the cliff. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Do you feel that love right now? Greater than the love of a mother. I know we always talk about the love of a mother for their child. But in hermeneutics, in um, it's a course that's taught here at the school. There's something called the law of first mention. The law of first mention. And when something is mentioned in the Bible for the first time, that's the high standard for viewing that particular thing. 
and you have to look at it like that the rest of the time. You know, Abraham, he paid a tenth. So that's, so it's not 9% or 8% or 7%. It's a tenth. It, because it's the first mention of the tithing. Well, in the Bible, the first time we understand love, it's the love of a father for his son. I am sometimes moved by worldly songs. And I have a crazy playlist. My wife thinks I'm crazy. But one of the songs on my playlist I hear at least once a week is Roberta Blake singing The First Time I Ever Saw Your Face. The Earth Moved. I know it's supposed to be a love song. But I think about March 14th, 1971, when for the first time I had a son. And the first time I saw his face. And I think about December the 7th, 1973, when the nurse brought the baby out in a blanket. And David, the first time I saw that big headed baby, <laughs> the earth moved. And I can tell you, I know that the love of a mother is great. But never discount the ability of fathers to love their children. a father and he loves all of us and I think sometimes he's up there and he just sits there and sings the first time I ever saw Johnny Wade's face oh I know some people don't think it's a very nice face somebody told me I had a face that only a mother could love Somebody else told me, Johnny, it's obvious God called you for radio, not television. <laughs> Even the college professor teaching television told me that. <laughs> but I know there is no baby so ugly that the father and mother do not love it. And the first mention of love is a father for his son. Because, oh, how he loved Jesus. You know, you like to sing, oh, how I love Jesus. Did you ever think about how the father sits up there and goes, oh, how I love Jesus. When he was baptized by John in the river, the Father spoke from heaven. The Father said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And I just want to tell you tonight that God will never stop loving you. You can't stop God from loving you. And you know on the cross, uh, let me just be real transparent for a moment. Let me just sort of stand naked in a sense. I've taught the young ministers that I've mentored that being a pastor that being in the role of a pastor is like Jesus on the cross on one side somebody was rejecting him on the other side someone was receiving him and he was caught between the forces and when you're a pastor 
you will always hang in the middle. You'll never get the pleasure of hanging on the left or the right. You will always hang in the middle. In between whatever the controversies are. Whether it's color or class or character or whatever it is, you're hanging in the middle. And he was not only on the middle cross, his feet were off the ground. <laughs> hanging between earth and heaven. That's where we are, preachers. We don't really have our feet on the ground. And our wives know that. And we don't really reach to heaven. We're just hanging naked somewhere in between. Between heaven and earth. And between the left and the right. And that's not all. Father, why have you forsaken me? There will be times no one is there. Paul himself wrote and said at my first answer, no one stood by me. I'll tell you something else I teach all the young preachers. And since this is the only night I'm preaching, I'm just doing what I want. I'm still talking about the shepherd. He's on the cross. I, I want to tell you, if it happened to Jesus, it will happen to you. Everything... Brian, that's ever happened to Jesus will happen to you. A, a friend will betray you. Someone will sell you out with a kiss. Yes, if it happened to Jesus, you'll hear crowds following and, and, and shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. I pastored a very unique church. And I went there knowing God sent me for a specific purpose. And that was to put a new foundation under that church. So that it would never have to be dealt with again anything that the other pastors had everyone dealt with. And I tell the young preachers, if it, if it happened to Jesus, it will happen to you. And you can be sure that you're going to get a chance to find out if, like you taught, we've truly denied ourselves, taken up our cross, and are following Him. So don't be discouraged. The Father hadn't forsaken him. There's all kinds of theology out there. And there's lots of commentaries. But my favorite commentary is the Sloan's commentary. Oh, they say, you know, Jesus had the sin on him so the Father couldn't look at him. Jesus had the sin of the world on him so the Father could not look at him. I don't believe that. When is the teacher silent? When, when will the teacher not talk? When you're taking a test, and when you feel like you're all by yourself, you're not. No, no, you're not. No, not at all. No. You know, the Indians, when the boys became a certain age, they had to go out and stay in the forest by themselves. To prove they were a man. 
And the little Indian boy went out. He found his spot and built his fire. He, he knew there was enemy tribes. He knew there was wild animals. So he just sat there. And he thought, I'm going to stay awake. And he kept watching. And just before, the, just before the light began to come, he saw in the shadow of the fire the wild fox or a wolf or whatever it was. And he thought, oh no. Oh no, uh, I, I have no weapon. And then he started looking around a little more. And over on the other side, he saw a tall Indian with his bow and arrow pulled, standing, standing there, standing there with the bow and arrow. And he thought, is that one of the enemy tribe? And then it got light. And it was his father, his own father. Ready to shoot that wolf. And he finds out he's been standing there all night. Another song we sing in America is standing somewhere in the shadow, you'll find Jesus. You may be walking, you may be walking through the valley of the shadow, but Jesus is there. Jesus is there. He's with you right now. And let me tell you one more thing about shadows. They're not even real. Most of what we worry about as pastors and preachers is never going to happen. It's never going to happen. I one time uh, went to the uh, college to take a course, uh, a Bible course. It was called Rational Christian Thinking. They said when you're always worrying about something that might happen, you're not being rational. When you're always saying, I wished I had of, I wished I had, if only that hadn't have happened. The if onlys at the past and the what ifs at the future have you in a degree of insanity. So the first week of the course I knew I wasn't rational. The second week of the course I knew I wasn't a Christian. And I knew I hadn't been thinking. I've worried about so much stuff. I've stayed up at night plotting strategies. And it was just a shadow. Thou preparest for me a table in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. And my cup runneth over. Now this is not the anointing like you would anoint a king to reign over a country. This is a feast at the king's house when all the guests arrive. Some, some of them like you. Some of them like you traveled far. Their skin is cracked. Their skin is cracked and dry. 
So part of hospitality, part of hospitality is to anoint the guests with oil. And pour them a glass of wine. In the presence of my enemies, he's feeding me. He anoints my head with oil. And my cup runs over. And surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. God has been so good to me. I'm not going to bore you with my story. But it's a miracle I'm alive. My sister, 15 months younger, she didn't survive. I, the anger of my father took her life. And my mother said I was the big brother. And I was to protect her. And I was just a, a barely a toddler myself. But I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember it like it was yesterday. And I want to tell you there's been so many things in my life. But one thing has constantly happened. No matter the violence around me, I've been chased by goodness and chased by mercy all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I close with this statement. I think in older days of Pentecost we talked about heaven too much. We all wanted to get out of here. And we didn't have a plan for staying here. In today's church we're too addicted to staying here. And we don't sing about, talk about, or preach about dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. I want to get the license plate for my uh, old uh, Cadillac. Old car. And the state of Ohio gave me one. And as soon as they handed it to me, I said, now I have to remember this. H C N 6 I'll never forget it. I got married in 69. I became a pastor in 75. Those was the biggest highlights of my life. Having a wife and having a church. 69.75. And you say, what does the HCN stand for? What does the HCN stand for? Well, to me, it means heaven comes next. And when I can't remember where my car is at, and I get lost in the Walmart parking lot, which I've done, I keep looking for heaven comes next. 69.75. I want to get back. I want to see you again. I don't want it to be 28 years. But no matter what, we don't have nothing to fear. This is not a burial chapter. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let your Holy Spirit comfort every heart in this room. Let the presence of Jesus be so real in the heart of every man and every woman. And Father, tonight, take away fear and anxiety and show them that the shadows aren't even real. In Jesus' name, Amen.
In Jesus name. In Jesus name. Amen. Year. And I can tell you that you're my favorite people in the world. And I guess you want me to explain that. Since I go to India so often. And, and Asia and those places. Well, my favorite people are the ones I'm with. I'm always happy wherever I am with whoever I'm with. These preachers right here, uh, Augustine and Janet and Larray and David and Brian, they're my favorite preachers. Because they're the ones looking at me right now. I think people should learn to live in the moment, be happy where you are, and trust God always. I never preach, I never preach or go anywhere without the picture of me and the young pastor 29 years younger than me. I pass the torch to him to be the pastor three years ago. And we actually carried a flaming torch down the aisle. And he is now my pastor. For 10 years, I was his pastor, and he, he started as youth pastor, and then associate pastor, and then he now is the lead pastor of the church. And I could not be more happy. And I keep this picture with me everywhere I go. It's always underneath my notes. Because I believe the local church is God's plan. And I believe every preacher needs a pastor. And right now my pastor is 29 years younger than me. But I pay my tithe. I go to church. I do anything he asks me. And I keep my nose out of everything. And I keep my hands off of everything. When he says, I want you to preach for me, I do. I never tell him what to do. He tells me what to do. I don't understand pastors that had one standard for when they were pastor. And then the rules change when they are no longer pastor. I'm going to live by the same beliefs that I had for the 41 years I was the head man. And I'm going to be the faithful church member that I tried to have other people be. So I'm here tonight representing our church in Hamilton, Ohio. They call me Global Ambassador. I like that better than emerita, Emeritus. <laughs> Pastor Emeritus. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the honored pastor. Yes, the honored pastor. No. I'm the global ambassador. I'm here to greet you on behalf of my church. And uh, I don't know how happy he'll be when I get back. But I definitely feel we've got to put some more money in Peru than we've been putting in. Psalm 
The great psalmist and king of Israel, David, he wrote Psalm 23. This chapter gets used at funerals a lot. But this is not a chapter for dying. This is a chapter for living. And David opens the door of his soul and lets us sense some of the glow from inside his heart. God declared that David was a man after his own heart. God never called any other man a man after his own heart. In Psalms 23, David makes a profound statement. And then he spends five verses proving it. And that's what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to quote what David said and take the following five verses and prove it. David said, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, in the ministry, I've needed lots of things. I remember when the church I was preaching for bought me the first suit I ever had. I remember when I was able to get a car. I remember lots of things I've needed. But I have never needed another shepherd than the shepherd of the Lord. You may be here with needs. You may be here tonight and have needs, things you need. But you do not need any shepherd other than Jesus. He will take care of all of it for you. Let's just look at it. It declares in Psalm 23 the character of God, not the character of David. The things that God is doing in this chapter are because of who God is, not because of who we are. You don't have to be good enough to have a good shepherd. He is a good shepherd by his character and his nature and who he is. It's not the character of the sheep that we're depending on. It's the character of the shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. When I studied this out some in the original language, it talks about tender grass. Yes. Grass that's easy to chew. And we need to fix our churches to where it's easy for people to become part of them. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Now, there are four things that a sheep has to have before it can lie down comfortably. First of all, there are two things about sheep that you will immediately recognize as being like your church. Sheep tend to be anxious. They're not naturally calm. They, they're kind of anxious. 
And what one of them does, the rest of them do. If the sheep are going across a pasture, and suddenly one of them jumps up in the air, not because there was something there, he just decided to jump. Then every sheep after him jumps at the same spot. And that's why we need good leaders that know when to jump and when not to jump. Because the sheep follow the other sheep. And it's so important that we understand that principle. Another thing about sheep is they have to know that there is going to be safety. There's a lot of things that can harm them. Sheep are very dependent on a shepherd. They're not an animal that can take care of themselves. They're not like the jaguar in Peru. No. No. They they need a lot of things. And they can't find it on their own. Somebody has to be their shepherd. Jesus looked down on Jerusalem and cried. And he saw the people of Jerusalem like sheep not having a shepherd. And I pray tonight that you will leave here with a shepherd's heart deeper than you've ever had. There is no greater title than pastor. Oh, I know some people want to be something else. Uh, the Reverend Doctor this, you know, all of those kind of things. But my favorite word to hear is for somebody to look at me and say, Pastor, oh, what a privilege. What, what, what a privilege to be a pastor. So the sheep, are, the sheep have to know that the shepherd is there, that they're going to be protected. So problem number one is solved. The shepherd is their peace. The second thing that sheep must have to lie down is for their own nature to calm down. Like, like many animals, there is a dominant factor in the herd. There is a dominant sheep. And people form sides. The sheep will actually perform, uh, choose sides. And so it's kind of like politics. It's kind of like a big church denomination or something. And the sheep can be button each other's heads. And sheep can butt you very hard. My mother said I was four years old when I told her I was a pastor. My dad at the time was working on a farm. And, and I chose to climb into the pen with the sheep. I guess it was my call to be a preacher. And one of them picked me up and slammed me into the room with them. And uh, my mother wanted to know how I got it. I lied. I'd been told not to be among the animals. I said I fell off my tricycle. Now maybe you're disappointed that I lied.